In our last session, we finished the account of Philip and the Ethiopian, narrating the Ethiopian's baptism. From there, we move to one of the crucial texts of the Acts of the Apostles, the, narr the narrative of the revelation or conversion of Saul. Our session ended with the accounts of two miracles by Peter, the cure of Aeneas and the raising of Tabitha. These form the backdrop to the material we shall look at now, the conversion of the house of Cornelius. In our current session, we shall examine the account of the conversion of the house of Cornelius, the Roman centurion. This account covers two chapters of Acts, 10 and 11. It's subdivided into several subsections. In the same way that he narrated the cure of Saul's blindness, Luke narrates the setup for the Cornelius account. Both Cornelius and Peter have a vision of each other. Cornelius in chapter in verses 1 to 8 and Peter in verses 9 to 23. This leads to their encounter, verses 23b to 33, which concludes in Peter's charismatic speech, verses 34 to 43. The result of Peter's speech is that Cornelius and his household are baptized, verses 44 to 49. The account closes with Peter returning to Jerusalem and explaining his actions to the leaders of the community gathered there along with the members of the community in chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. The locale of the Cornelius account is Caesarea, where Cornelius was a centurion of the Italian cohort. Luke tells us. Now, this Caesarea is Caesarea Maritima, Caesarea by the sea, on the shores of the Mediterranean, which you can see in this picture. It must be distinguished from Caesarea Philippi, located much further north and east at the source of the Jordan River. This Caesarea was one of the major port cities of the Holy Land at the time of Jesus, built by Herod the Great from about 22 until 10 BC. When Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70, Caesarea Maritima became the provincial capital of the Roman province of Judea, which at that time encompassed the entire Holy Land. Here are a few pictures, again as a picture, that gives you a sense of what Caesarea Maritima was like. A general view of the seacoast at Caesarea. This is just to the right of what many think was the palace of the Roman governor. One of two major sites remaining in Caesarea today is the ancient Roman theater, which today still remains used as a functioning theater. During the Crusader period, Caesarea served as a significant port city, and there was a Crusader city built, which you can see in this photo. It was at this time that Caesarea became a dominion in the kingdom of Jerusalem the Crusader kingdom established by Baldwin I, and the Latin Rite See of Caesarea was established with 10 archbishops from 1101 to 1266. One further site that's a bit inland is the Roman aqueduct at Caesarea pictured here. Now the account begins introducing us to Cornelius. As we mentioned, he's a centurion, that is a commander of 100 men. His, his cohort is known as Italica. Johnson points out that this is an anachronism. There's no evidence supporting the presence of the unit Italica in Caesarea for the period of 41 to 44. This centurion is described as pious, fearing God along with his whole household, generous in giving alms, who prayed to God earnestly. He reminds us of another centurion that Luke highlighted in his gospel, the centurion in Luke 7, 1 to 10.
As proof of the fact that Cornelius had adopted Jewish practices, he is praying at the ninth hour, that is, three o'clock in the afternoon. And in his prayer, he sees the vision of an angel of God coming to him and addressing him by name, Cornelius. Cornelius's response was to stare at the angelic vision in fear, uttering the words, what is it, sir? Cornelius's prayer and alms have been rewarded. They've risen before God as a memorial. Johnson sees this as an allusion to Sirach 35.7. The sacrifice of the righteous man is acceptable, and the memory of it will not be forgotten. The angel then gives Cornelius the command to send to Joppa to summon the man Simon, who was also called Peter, who happens to be lodging with Simon the Tanner in a house by the sea, which is where we left him last session. This is precisely the spot. Cornelius is quick to obey the angelic messenger. He calls two servants and a soldier and quickly sends them southward toward Joppa. Kurtz notes that presumably being of the household of Cornelius, these share his faith in the God of Israel. As the mission from Cornelius is on the road to Joppa, the scene shifts from Caesarea to Joppa, where Peter is also praying. At the house of Simon the Tanner, Peter goes to pray on the roof terrace at approximately the sixth hour. That's about 12 noon. Peter, during the course of his prayer, grew hungry and wanted to eat. It would be time for the midday meal, which in many cases was the major meal of the day. While the servants were making preparations for the noonday meal, Peter, in the course of his prayer, experiences a trance, that is, a state of being outside of oneself. Ecstasis, the Greek word, means stasis, to stand, ek, outside of oneself. In the course of this trance or vision, Peter witnesses the heavens opened, that is, the division between God and humanity was rent. Further from heaven, a great sheet was dropping, toward the earth by its four corners. The contents of this sheet were a bit startling to Peter. In it were all four-footed creatures of the earth, reptiles of the earth, and birds of the air. Emphasis here is on all that is in the sheet. All that is in the sheet would have been presumably clean, that is, permissible to eat, but also unclean, since it's all forbidden to eat. Animals were intermixed with the clean. From heaven, a voice now gives the command. Once you have risen, slaughter and then eat. Peter was taken aback because as a good Jewish man, he had never allowed anything unclean to pass through his lips. Now a heavenly voice is telling him to forget all that and eat what's on this sheet. So naturally, Peter protests. On no account, he says, ever have I ever eaten anything uncommon or unclean. Peter's referring to the fact that in the sheet he's been commanded to eat from, there are clean and unclean animals. Kurtz comments that the unclean creatures on the sheet by their presence there have contaminated the clean. Therefore, Peter, in accord with the Mosaic law, is unable to, unable to eat anything on the sheet. Yet God has commanded him to kill and eat from the creatures on that sheet. Here, we have a picture of the main altar of the Church of St. Peter's in Joppa. The painting behind the tabernacle and the altar depicts the ecstatic vision of Peter that we have been describing. Note the angel with the white sheet in the background.
Peter's protest is not acceptable to the voice that's speaking. So the voice speaks a second time. What God has cleansed, you do not make or consider to be ceremonially unclean. The immediate implication is that God does not make anything which is unclean. Thus, all creation is clean by virtue of being created by God. This is similar to the discussion on clean and unclean foods in Mark 7, where Jesus declares all foods clean. But as we shall see, this vision has ramifications far beyond what one can and cannot eat. The vision occurs a third time, and then the sheet was taken up into heaven. The fact that this occurs three times signals the fact that this is something that is significant for Peter, even though it has significance that may be evading Peter right now. So, Peter's left on the roof puzzling about what the meaning of the experience he has just had might be. The verb used here, diaporeo, gives us a sense of Peter's state of mind. It comes from two Greek words, the preposition dia meaning through, and the verb aporeo meaning to be perplexed, hence to be thoroughly perplexed. Peter cannot fathom why he has received this vision, nor what exactly it is supposed to mean for him. It's curious in that moment of perplexity that the messengers from Cornelius come, asking the location of the house of Simon the Tanner, and whether a certain Simon, known also as Peter, was there, as they stand at the gate. As Kurtz puts it, Peter ponders. The three men from Cornelius inquire about Peter's presence there. Making a second reference to Peter's pondering of the vision that he just had, we're told that the Spirit confirms the legitimacy of the visitors at the house of Simon the Tanner. They have been sent by the Spirit. Peter is thus to accompany them without hesitation. The Greek verb used here has the same sense of being in strife, in strife with, leading to hesitation or waiting. Peter's not to do this. Rather, he's to act immediately as the spirit is in control. And indeed, Peter's response appropriately is immediate. He gets up, goes down to meet the visitors. Then Peter announces, that he is the man whom they're looking for, for I am the one whom you seek, followed by a question. What's the purpose in their seeking them? They then recount the vision that Cornelius had in his home in Caesarea, announcing that he is to seek out a certain Peter, invite him to his home, and listen to what he has to say. As a result, Peter invites the guests to dine with him. The word used, zenidzo, means literally to treat as a stranger, but more properly here, to treat as a guest and thus to entertain. Thus, in line with the typical Middle Eastern hospitality, Peter invites the men to share a table with him. He's forsaken all hesitation as he suddenly realizes that his vision sent by the Holy Spirit and the Cornelius's vision sent by God through an angel puts a divine seal of approval on the event. So even though they are strangers, Zenoi, that is Gentiles, Peter shows them the same hospitality as though they were fellow Jews. They're sent by God. And who is Peter? to get into the way of that. Presumably, lodging was also offered for the night, as the next verse notes it was the next day. 
Peter accompanies them with some of the brethren from Joppa. Johnson tells us that these brethren from Joppa are identified. Later in Acts 1045, they are described as believers from the circumcision party. They, like Peter, are Jewish Christians who are given the privilege of witnessing the conversion of these Gentiles. Acts 11.12 notes that the number of those traveling with Peter was six. These six brethren also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. The scene now switches to Caesarea and the house of Cornelius. It was clear that Cornelius had been expecting Peter, as he had gathered together his relatives and close friends. Thus, the whole house of Cornelius, including his extended family, is gathered for what's about to occur. So Peter arrives and enters the house. Cornelius greets him, falling at his feet, paying him homage. For a centurion, the act of falling at one's feet was to submit oneself to their authority. It's paying him homage that's curious. The Greek verb proskuneo, which is translated many times as worship. The implication is that Cornelius sees Peter as having authority, but more significantly, he has the authority of a god. Now, realizing that the action of Cornelius is meant for God alone and not for human beings, Peter raises Cornelius up, saying, Arise, for I too am a human being, and not implying not a god. And Peter will not allow what belongs to God alone to be ascribed to him. Then Peter, accompanied by Cornelius, finds the large group, the extended family, and the household that had been gathered. Then he begins recalling the situation and its unusual circumstances. Peter reminds them that it is forbidden in Jewish law for a Jew to associate or visit with another race, that is, the Gentiles. But here he is. Why? because God had shown him that he should not call anyone common or unclean. Peter has come to realize the real message of his vision. It was not about dietary laws. It was about real people and the mission God had for Peter. Thus, there was re th thus that was the reason Peter was called through this vision and why he came with the messengers who had been sent by Cornelius as a result of the, mission, of the vision. Then Cornelius recounts his vision and what led him to send to Joppa for Peter, ending with the observation, now therefore, we are all here present in the sight of God to hear all that you, Peter, have been commanded by the Lord. So Peter responds to Cornelius' observation. Opening his mouth, he begins to speak. Truly, I understand that God is not literally a receiver of faces, that is, one who shows partiality. The Greek noun prosopolemtes is usually translated as show no parti partiality, that is, not choose one face over another. Rather, God in all nations deems acceptable those who fear God and those who act righteously. Thus, God does not choose on the basis of natural origin, national origin. Rather, God chooses those who respect him and try to live in proper relationship with him, despite any ethnic or national origin. Peter clearly has understood the message of the vision that he had had in Joppa. Then he challenges Cornelius to remember what he had heard. The word of God was sent to Israel 
through the good news preached by Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Jesus is sent to Israel, but his word is to extend far beyond Israel, since he is not just the Lord of Israel, but rather he is the Lord of all. Then Peter gives a short history of the ministry of Jesus and his proclamation of the word. Peter can speak of these things because he was a witness to them. He was with Jesus during that ministry and heard him proclaim that word. Then he narrates the result of that proclamation. They, the Jewish leaders, killed him, hanging him on a tree. But using the standard refrain of acts thus far, God raised him up on the third day. And the definitive proof that Peter is a witness, God made this Jesus manifest not only to all, but to us, that is, those chosen who ate and drink, drank with him after the resurrection. The consequence of this manifestation is that God ordered us to preach the, to the people, testifying that Jesus is the one designated to judge the living and the dead. Kurtz notes that being Gentiles, Cornelius and his household would more than likely be familiar with the Jewish messianic prophecies. And so he cites the fact that Jesus was raised to argue that Jesus is the one appointed by God as the judge and the, of the living and the dead. Paul will make a similar claim when he speaks to the Athenians on the Areopagus in chapter 17. Peter concludes, noting that to this, that is what he has just spoken, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the prophets have borne witness with the result that everyone who hears these words and believes in Jesus will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. Kurt sees this as an invitation to the hearers to be saved. He says the essence of salvation is that the people's sins are forgiven by invoking Jesus' name because of all that he has accomplished on their behalf. Simultaneous to Peter's offering this invitation, his speech is interrupted by the action of the Spirit who fell upon all those who were listening. Johnson notes that this is the fourth outpouring of the Spirit in Acts. Acts 2, 1 to 4, Acts 4, 3, Acts 8, 17, and now Acts 10, 44. The reaction of those from the Jews with Peter is astonishment. Literally, they were standing outside of themselves. That's that verb existemi again. Why? The Spirit had been poured out upon them, upon them the Gentiles, in the very same way that it was poured out on the community in chapter 2. This astonishment continued as the Gentiles of Cornelius' house, as a result of the Spirit, were now speaking in tongues and extolling God, similar again to the results of the Spirit in chapter 2. Thus, the spirit had fallen upon the gent that had fallen upon the Gentiles was the same spirit that had fallen upon the Jews. Having experienced the spirit, Peter now calls for their baptism. Can anyone forbid water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Peter then directs that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. After the baptism, Peter is invited to remain in Caesarea for some days. Ben Witherington notes that we have a story here of conversion, 
actually two conversions. Peter was converted to a new point of view about the Gentiles as part of God's people, and Cornelius and his household were converted to a new view of Jesus Christ. The scene now switches from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the apostles and members of the community in Judea, the mother church, heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. Seemingly, these did not have a problem with the Gentiles being converted and being baptized. However, when Peter returned to Jerusalem, he discovered that not all in the mother church were in tune with his actions in Caesarea. A small vocal group within the Jerusalem church, those of the circumcision, Jewish Christians, criticized Peter for his actions of entering the homes of the uncircumcised, that is Gentiles, and even eating with them. Now it seems that these Jewish Christians were not too upset with the fact that Peter had baptized Cornelius in his household. It was the violation of the law, entering the uncircumcised home and eating with them that upset them. Once Peter finds himself in a situation in which he has to defend his actions, he recounts in meticulous detail what had happened. He had a vision of a sheet with clean and unclean animals and was told to eat, which horrified him. Then the messengers arrive from the house of Cornelius and tell Peter of Cornelius's vision. Peter then goes to the house of Cornelius and speaks concerning Jesus. But before he was finished speaking, the spirit descended on Cornelius and his household, as it had on the disciples. This similarity, Johnson says, is necessary because it becomes the basis for asserting their equality of membership in the community. A redefinition of the religion itself is in process. This, then, is the beginning of the shift of Christianity from being a sect of Judaism to being a full-fledged religion on its own. Peter then recalls how that experience led him to recall the words of Jesus. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. There's a double reference here. First, Jesus had told the apostles that John baptized with water. But before a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is a direct reference to the experience of Pentecost, which the disciples had 10 days after the Ascension. But that reference also goes back to the distinction made by John the Baptist, that he baptizes with water, but the one coming after him, that is Jesus, will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Then Peter poses the key question, based on what he had just narrated. If God gave the same gift to the Gentiles as to us who believed, who was I to stand in the way or hinder God? Thus, Peter baptized the house of Cornelius in response to God's action, which now, is, which now explained his original vision. This was an equal gift for the Jewish and the Gentile believers, albeit they received it at different times. Johnson draws the conclusion, if it is a gift in both cases that establishes membership in the Messianic community, rather than ethnic origin or even having been a follower of Jesus during his ministry, then neither is there room for discrimination in church practice. Peter's defense seems to have convinced the critics. They grew quiet and ceased their criticism. They glorified God in response to his wondrous activities in Caesarea. The conclusion of the account 
confirms that God has given repentance to life, even to the Gentiles. The favor of God is not something to be prized by Jewish Christians alone. Peter realizes that this, is a, that, th that this as the deeper meaning of the vision of the sheet with clean and unclean that he had seen at Joppa. Along with Peter, the Jewish community recognizes the faith of the Gentiles, but they still have some questions. The final resolution of this question will have to wait until chapter 15 with the Council of Jerusalem, which was convened after Paul returned having converted a significant number of Gentiles in his first missionary journey. Well, that's about all the time we have for this session. It was an involved one, and one that points a direction for the developing church. Next time, we shall, we shall look at the results of the dispersal of the community at the time of Stephen's martyrdom in particular, the formation of the church at Antioch. This will be followed by a look at the persecution of the Jerusalem community by Herod Antipas, in which James, the brother of John, was martyred. In the same persecution, Peter is once more arrested, yet once more miraculously escapes to rejoin the community at the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark. See you then.